How's it going and welcome to No Fun Allowed's guide series on Curse of Strahd, a 5th edition module. In today's video we'll be diving into the Abbey of St. Markovia, the only bastion of holiness left in this land. Of course there's going to be a ton of spoilers so players do not watch this, but DMs that want added insight on how we can run this thing, go ahead and stick around because we have a lot to cover. And here we are, the Abbey of St. Markovia, which rests atop, of course, the village of Kresk. Village of Kresk isn't all that exciting, but of course there's many ways we can go ahead and jush that up. Already covered that in one video, and we'll be covering it in many more videos. But here we're going to be talking about the Abbey itself, because this is the exciting part of this location. Now what makes this Abbey so crazy, and what is causing all those noises in the middle of the day and night? Why, it is a convent of mongrel folk. People that have been mutated and twisted over time. They are all now inbred and creepy and scary and insane. And of course, leading this whole group of people is the abbot himself. A divine being that has sadly fallen to the darkness all around. In areas of the abbey here, we get some good information that if your players interact with anybody that isn't a notably named character or just one that doesn't have any sort of information, you should go ahead and roll on the indefinite madness table to see what is ailing them. This table can mean that they are clinically insane or really not all that different really. The only mongrel folk that are not locked away inside of this location are Otto and Siegfried as well as Cloven. Otto and Siegfried, they are the gravediggers that are around here and they are the ones that go out and collect the bodies all around the village of Kresk. But Cloven, Cloven is special because you see, your players could be led here because Cloven could be a fated ally. After your party ascends up the cliff side, then they can go ahead and see this. Beautiful art, use it. <laughs> I can't preach it enough. Fantastic stuff. Your players are going to see that there is some strange things going on here. They're going to see that there is, in fact, some gravestones right there. And they're going to see this large looming tower with what appears to be some broken out windows. And it looks as if there are some guards that are hanging outside at the uh, wall there. But as we'll soon discover, those are not actual guards. Those are just scarecrows that are mounted there to give it a presence. In area 6, we have the north gate. Your players arrive and they'll discover, of course, that there's a tiny little gate. And it appears as if there should be some people on watch, but they are incredibly lazy and are currently sleeping. Pretty bad at their jobs, really. It is here where we find Otto and Siegfried Bellevue. And as we'll be getting into, every single one of these mongrel folk has the last name of Bellevue because they are all from the same family that all became horribly mutated and are the family that they are today. If your players just stumble their way through here, then of course they're going to wake up the guards and the two are going to go ahead and confront the party. But your party does have the possibility of sneaking around and trying to sneak their way in, in which case they only need a DC 12 stealth check, which isn't that bad at all. For role-playing the mongrel folk, we actually get some pretty good details here. It goes down to how tall they are, and what are their abnormalities, and what they sound like, and their sort of mannerisms. And of course we get their insanity. We have Otto being, I am the smartest, wisest, strongest, fastest, and most beautiful person I know. And Siegfried having, I don't like the way people judge me all the time. Of course, looking at these people, they immediately will probably assume that these manga folk are not the smartest people around, and your players may be judgy, in which case they might ruffle some feathers here, or maybe in this case some fur and scales. So hopefully your party isn't too mean up front, in which case they can go ahead and actually make friends with these manga folk, who will go ahead and lead them in and get them an audience with the abbot himself. In Area 7 we have the Graveyard. Your players might not immediately go here, and they may not think anything of it. And, of course, right when they get here for the very first time, they might not have any inclination of what's going on here. But, of course, we can see that there's something special in this graveyard. The Sun's Grave. The gravestone marked with X is carved with roses and bears a 3-inch diameter sun-shaped indentation on the east side. Engraved beneath the indentation is the name Petrovna. If Tasha Petrovna's holy symbol is placed in the indentation, both the holy symbol and the indentation vanish, and then something magical happens. A ray of golden sunlight breaks through the clouds to the west and shines upon the grave. The fog and the gloom shrink into the brilliance of the sunlight, 
and caused the gravestone to crack and crumble, revealing a ring within. This is so epic and so cool. But here's the real kicker. The only way they could ever pull this off is if your players already went to Castle Ravenloft, specifically went to Area 84 in the crypts, and were able to get that symbol and take it all the way back here. Of course, I'm going to be doing a whole lot of videos on Castle Ravenloft, and that's going to be at the end of the series. But let's go ahead and take a little flash right here. In this area, Crypt 11, we have Tasha Petrovna, Healer of Kings, Light Unto the West, Servant, Companion. Inside of this location, draped around the neck of the skeleton is a sun-shaped holy symbol. A good aligned character who picks up this holy symbol hears a ghostly female voice. It whispers the following message. There's a grave to the west with roses that never die. In a place built by healers in a village called Kresk. When all turns to darkness, touch this holy symbol to the grave to summon the light and find the treasure long lost. This is awesome. This is incredible. And, of course, not only is this cool symbolically, the reward is massive. If your players pull this off, they get this holy symbol all the way from the crypts and get it to here, then they are rewarded with a Ring of Regeneration. A Ring of Regeneration is an incredibly powerful item. While wearing this ring, you gain 1d6 hit points every 10 minutes, provided that you at least have one hit point remaining. If you lose a body part, the ring causes the missing part to regrow after 1d6 plus 1 days and you have at least one hit point the whole time so this is incredibly awesome it's really strong and depending on the game that you're running if it is a high attrition game where they're going into a lot of encounters in a single day this will help out but here's the kicker more often than not most people don't allow their players to roam around castle ravenloft i personally think that you should allow your players to roam around castle ravenloft early and multiple times because it can lead to fun roleplay moments like this if you're running a traditional game of Castle of Ravenloft, and by traditional game, of course, I mean how most people seem to run it, then this will never happen. I certainly think that this has a beautiful sentiment in the campaign, and it shouldn't just be something that's done after the campaign. I think this is something that certainly can and potentially should happen in the middle of the campaign, or maybe right near the very end, before they go to Castle Ravenloft for the last time. I've already made a video with Dinner with Strahd, and it'll go ahead and pop up right here. And I kind of detail a little bit about how your players can go ahead and roam around Castle Ravenloft. But when it comes to the actual location itself, I know there's going to be a huge ton of videos on that. In Area 8, we have the Garden Gatehouse. The gatehouse is empty. <laughs> Why? What's the point of detailing out in location if there's no detail? Whatever. In Area 9, we have the gardens because there's a lot of hungry mouths to feed. And these gardens are certainly the only way that they're going to be fed. So, of course, as we can see here on the map, there's a ton of whites. Why is that? That is because if the fortunes of Ravenloft dictate that the item is located here, then the card will reveal that the object of their desire is located in the southernmost Scarecrow. If the treasure is removed from the Scarecrow, seven whites erupt from the gardens and attack. They wear tattered livery of Strahd's house. Once again, plug in more of my own videos here. I will be doing a video on detailing out every single little location on the little tarot deck here. And believe me, that's going to be a pain because there is a lot of cards to go through. But I think there's certainly a lot of information that can be gleamed looking into every single one of these locations. In Area 10, we have the Abbey Entrance. This is the location that your players are going to be marched to if they go along with the two guards. But, of course, they could just be going here if they snuck in on their own because it's the only natural way to go through here. And they're also going to see that there is those guards stationed up there, but an easy DC-10 perception check reveals that they are just simply scarecrows that are propped up. Area 11, the inner gatehouse, pretty much nothing going on here at all whatsoever. In Area 12, we have the courtyard, and as we can tell, there's a lot of things going on here. If the characters are escorted here by Otto and Siegfried, then they're going to be told to wait here while they go ahead and retrieve the abbot. People are probably going to be curious about what's going on here, so they might go ahead and start looking around. In which case, some things might go bump in the night. Your players will be able to see that there's a well directly in the center of this place. And if they get curious, they're going to go ahead and look over, and then they will see it. They will see Mishka Bellevue. Mishka is going to go ahead and scurry up and attack anybody that he can see, because his madness is sadly that he enjoys killing people. So, if this happens, then your players are probably going to get freaked out. You know, they just get ahead and get left behind, then all of a sudden some weird creature just pops out of the well and starts attacking them. 
So that might leave a sour taste in your players' mouths. If you have a group that is easily startled and goes ahead and attacks after they get attacked, then this could be disastrous. If you want to have it where your players get to actually interact with the area around them, then you may want to refrain from having Mishka jump on them. Maybe say that Mishka is trapped at the bottom of the well and can't really get up. Maybe the walls are too slippery or something. But if you think that your players are okay with killing one of these people and then interacting with the other ones around here, then that's perfectly fine. In the area C's located all around this location, we have these chicken sheds, which are sadly not being held with chickens. They have crazy mongrel folk that are basically in solitary. So, uh, yeah, once again, if your players go up there and see these people, you know, acting erratically and crazy, hopefully they don't get themselves into any too much trouble. In area D, we have the tethering post, and it's here where we have a winged mongrel folk who is trying to fly away because, unfortunately, Marzina has the following flaw. I am convinced powerful enemies are hunting me and their agents are everywhere. So if your players see that she is trying to flutter around and try and free herself, you may have some kind hearts that go ahead and try and free her, in which case she's going to go ahead and fly off and never return, never to be seen again. In area 13, we have the main hall. Whether your players go ahead and sneak up in here or the abbot goes ahead and brings them in, they are going to see all this amazing stuff. And there's a huge little block of what your players are going to be able to see. But the big thing about this location is this might be the first time your players interact with Vasilka. And Vasilka is sadly not a big talker. Because, you see, she is not just any ordinary woman. She is a flesh golem, an amalgamation, a construct. You see, this is the reason why those mongrel folk could come down to the town and retrieve the bodies of the recently dead. It is because the abbot needs body parts, because he is trying to make someone special. In fact, he is trying to construct a beautiful bride for the count of this land, Strahd von Zarovich. It's here where we get a lot of great information on how to roleplay Basilica and, of course, the Abbot. And you see, the Abbot is an interesting figure here. We would think that immediately that the Abbot is immediately a villain, but it's more like he's antagonistic because he is trying to appease Strahd by making this beautiful bride. But unfortunately, for all that he tries, it's probably not going to work out. For role-playing the abbot, we get, once again, more great information here. The abbot believes that he is righteous. He regrets transforming the Bellevues into horde mongrel folk, and he considers their imprisonment to be necessary to contain their madness. He also believes that building a bride for Strahd is going to free the land, so he's going to do everything in his power to go ahead and do that. He's actually going to request the players to go ahead and find a bridal gown, a beautiful thing, so that Vasilka can wear it and she can be beautiful and be presented as a offering in a way to Strahd. He is not going to be outwardly hostile. If the players are kind, then he's going to be kind. But if the players try and fight, then he's going to go ahead and fight. And unfortunately, people that try and fight this guy are going to learn real quick that he is a divine being. He is pretty freaking strong. Something very key to note here is when he says, hey, can you find me a bridal gown? If you do so, I will raise the dead three times for you. So if any of you die, I can go ahead and bring you back. Or if there's anybody that you have right now that's dead, I can go ahead and bring them back. That's a pretty big incentive. If your players get told this and they have someone that they like that's already died in this campaign, whether that be a PC or an NPC, your players may go ahead and take that hook. In which case, they'll go traipsing around trying to find wherever this thing is and go ahead and bring it back and get a pretty sweet power. For finding a bridal gown, that'll be covered in the special events of the Village of Kreska chapter. Also located in Area 13, we have some potions of healing and a whole bunch of gold. Pretty typical stuff for this module because a ton of gold gets handed out. And gold gets handed out like it's candy here. But also importantly is one of the fortunes of Ravenloft can be found here. If your card reading reveals that the treasure is here, it is hidden in the niche behind the wall alongside the potions. On the opposite side of the abbey here, we have area 14, the foyer. 
If your players go ahead and start coming in here, they will hear the unnatural whispers, mad laughter, and bestial odors of this location. And they will truly know that they are in a madhouse. If they generate enough noise or carry some light in here, then the flesh golem that's located around here will go ahead and make its way over to them. And will start beating them down unless they have a assistant with them. In area 15, we have the madhouse. It's here where your players are going to be hearing all the crazy commotion that's going on. And if they dare open any of these doors, they will be met by whatever is going on in whatever individual room. As previously mentioned, your players come in here and they don't have an escort. Then that flush golem is going to go ahead and strike out against them. In which case, if they are a lower level, bad news bears. But if they're a higher level, it probably shouldn't be that big of a deal. Reading through this area, you will discover which rooms are hostile encounters and which ones aren't, and which ones can potentially be hostile encounters. As we can see here in area A, they are not innatively hostile, but if anyone tries to take any of the items that are in their possession, then the mongrel folk are gonna go ahead and strike out. Here, you should go ahead and play them up individually. You should go ahead and show off that they are not just individualistic. They are not all thinking of the same mind. Some of them will be hostile natively, and some of them won't be. You should totally express that to your players so they don't go on a murder spree here. Unless you have, of course, murder hobos, and that's the norm, then I guess go ahead and have at it, I guess. In area F, we have the singing and dancing mongrel folk, and it's here where they'll go ahead and be chanting out to this creepy little poem. But what's interesting is, is they have this glittering gold statuette, and if this thing is taken, then whoever takes it, if they are a good aligned creature, will gain a plus one bonus to saving throws, which is a pretty big deal. But uh, unfortunately, if you have a good aligned person, they might not go ahead and steal this thing. So, you know, that's kind of a weird position to be in. If you have a good aligned person, they're not going to want to steal and murder people. So how do they get this thing? Well, I mean, that's entirely up to your party, right? Maybe if you have someone who's not good aligned and comes in here and snaps the thing, then the good aligned character at some point may go ahead and touch it, at which point they feel a certain surge and a warmth about them, in which case they might go ahead and start latching onto this thing. And that can be pretty neat. Play up these mongrel folk as not entertaining because it is tragic and sad, but you should definitely play it up as memorable and you should play it up not just as one big combat slog because of course not all of them are gonna immediately strike out. They will defend themselves, of course, but the interesting thing here is these mongrel folk only stay in their rooms, even though they're unlocked, only because of that flesh golem. They fear that flesh golem. So if your players come in here and kill the thing, and then they start going room to room, maybe some mongrel folk poke their heads out and see that flesh golem's dead, and then they go ahead and make a mad dash out of here. In which case, your players could inadvertently go ahead and release a huge swarm of mongrel folk that start parading around the place. And maybe they even make their way over to the village of Kresk. And that will be their fault. And, you know, that can lead to a whole bunch of fun different scenarios. In area 16, we have the wine cellar. As we all know, wine is a pretty hot commodity in the land of Barovia. So, of course, any wine that could potentially be found here is a pretty big deal. But, of course, the real treasure to be found here isn't just the wine. It is among the wine bottles on the rack is one with no stopper. And the label reads, Champagne du la Stomp. It contains a rolled up spell scroll of Hero's Feast. Hero's Feast is traditionally a pretty freaking hard spell to use because one, it requires six level spell casting, but two, it also usually takes a thousand gold. So finding a spell scroll of this, just a free casting of it, that's a pretty big deal. This is definitely an item you or players are gonna hold on to and probably use right as they storm Castle Ravenloft for the very last time if they ever find this thing. So, you know, it's a pretty awesome item. Your players sit down, have a grand old feast, and uh, gain some temp HP, and all that fun jazz. In area 17, we have the Loft and Belfry. This is, of course, where the bell gets tolled. But hopefully it doesn't toll for thee. This is actually the location where the abbot constructs all of his flesh golems, and it is also the location where Cloven Bellevue resides. We get some great information on role-playing Cloven Bellevue here in regards of what he looks like, all of his abnormalities, the fact that he's a drunk, the fact that he is, of course, you know, faithful to the abbot, but if the abbot were to die, then he would have nothing else really going on here because he doesn't really like all the other mongrel folk. This location also bears something very important. 
This is one of the teleportation locations located in Castle Ravenloft. So that does infer that at some point, Strahd must have come here and done some deeds. You know, that kind of paints a tale. If your players move around Castle Ravenloft and discover that they can teleport to here, then that, you know, could lead to an interesting little story. Also located in this room, we have the thing on the table. It, located on the side there, there is a table, and it has some body parts on it. But if someone comes over to it, they will see that they recognize the party parts as their own. But it's, of course, just a cheap little illusion that Strahd conjures up. It's just some body parts that have been left over that the abbot didn't use for his latest creation. Area 18, the wall here. This is where your players could go ahead and make their way from one location to another. And they can also see up close the scarecrows that are propped up all around. Area 19, we have the barracks. Not really anything special going on here, just a few beds. But what is interesting is this gives us a location where your players could meet Esmeralda for the very first time. If your players haven't already met Esmeralda, then yeah, this could be a pretty decent way to introduce Esmeralda to your players. Of course, there is a huge epic and tragic backstory involving Esmeralda and all that fun jazz. She could be the fated ally, or she could just be someone that tags along with the party for a bit. She's a pretty badass person, and she certainly fits if you want to put her here. But of course, there's many other locations that your players could find her as well. In Area 20, we have the upstairs office. This is just a little connector here to get to the other locations. Nothing really too much going on. Except for, of course, they could potentially hear the laughters, whoops, and screams of the mongrel folk below. Area 21, we have the Haunted Hospital. It's here where your players can go ahead and see that there's a ton of beds here. And they can also see that there's an operating room, a nursery, and a morgue beyond. Should anyone linger around here for too long, six shadows will pop up and begin draining the party. Which, doesn't matter what level you are, shadows are potentially scary. They don't need to kill you by doing damage to you. They can potentially just kill you by strength draining you down to zero. In Area 22, we have the operating room. If anyone makes their way inside of here, they can hear long forgotten screams of something that happened long, long ago, but they fade away. Area 23, the nursery, they can find, of course, what appears to be a nursery at some point. And once again, another fortune of Ravenloft could lead them here. It'll be found in the wreckage of one of the cribs. There might be a lot of stories to tell with that one. And lastly here, we have Area 24, the morgue. Perched up on the windowsill is a raven. If for some reason your players are on a murder spree against ravens and kill this thing, then whoever kills it is cursed, and they gain disadvantage on all attack rolls and ability checks. A greater restoration spell, a remove curse, or something similar will end the curse. So hopefully your players already know the motif of, you know, don't hit the ravens, don't mess with them because you'll be cursed. That actually doesn't apply anywhere else in the entirety of the campaign. It does mean that you'll probably be on the bad side of the Were Raven society. But as long as, you know, they don't actually hit or kill any of the Were Ravens, it's probably not that big of a deal. But here it is. If you kill this one random raven, you are cursed in a terrible curse at that. If your party doesn't have any way to deal with this, then that person is pretty much ruined. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know if that's really something you should just thrust upon them if they, for some reason, kill this thing. But at the end of the day, you know, run a hardcore campaign if you desire. I certainly think that this is fitting if you have a murder hobo, that they go ahead and be cursed for being a murder hobo. So now that we're done with all the locations, I want to go ahead and dive into the Abbot. I will be doing a whole villain's voice on the Abbot because he is a very interesting and unique character, but I want to go over just some basic things to go ahead and tie up this whole location here. So first off, let's look at his stat block. He is a Deva, and what does that mean? That means he's a badass. 17 natural AC, 136 hit points, but look at that, he hits like a truck. He has the angelic weapons feature. If he attacks anybody with any weapon, it deals an additional 48 radiant damage. Pretty awesome, pretty cool. In addition to that, he can also heal himself or anybody that he wants to touch. So if your players attack this guy, then he can go ahead and fly around and heal himself up and then get right back in the fight. And your players are probably not going to be able to match his healing and damage output. He's resistant to non-magical damage, he has pretty high saving throws, and he has advantage on magical saving throws. So this guy is pretty tough to deal with. 
But the real kicker here, the, the basically the only difference between him and any other Deva, is look at his alignment. He is lawful evil. He, at one point, was a holy being, but he has sadly fallen from grace. For me, I personally see this person as someone who is trying to do good in this world, but he has sadly succumbed to the darkness all around. He is trying his utmost to appease Strahd, but in doing so is doing terrible acts, but he is probably doing so with the mentality that the ends justify the means. I see the abbot as a Jean Javert or a Claude Frollo, someone who truly believes in the law, but unfortunately, you know, bad things must be done in order to make the good things happen. Once the players meet him, whether they go ahead and sneak on in here or the mongrel folk go ahead and introduce them, the abbot's going to welcome them with open arms. He's going to say, hey, how's it going? Welcome to the abbey. Let me go ahead and show you around a bit and let's talk and let's eat and let's have some fun here. And let me show off Strahd's new bride. And then he goes ahead and shows off Basilica. At which point your party's going to be like, whoa, what's going on here? Eesh. And unfortunately, they may learn that the abbot is not exactly the most good guy. He is demanding. And, and more so, specifically with the special events that are going on in this chapter, we'll be getting into next video, is the abbot is very demanding. And unfortunately, if his demands are not met, he will go ahead and strike down with divine retribution. Your players have a pretty decent chance of coming here. And why is that? Well, that's because if you do the card reading completely at random, then it is very likely that one of the cards ends up here because there's a lot of locations that reside in here that could have a fortune of Ravenloft. And also importantly is the fact that three of the fated allies could be located here. We have Vasilka, Cloven Bellevue, and Esmeralda. There is a lot of things going on here that could lead your players here. And also importantly is it doesn't even need to be a card reading that could lead your players here. Your players could hear that there is a holy place left in this land and they may go ahead and just go here because of their own fruition. They may hear that there is a holy saint still left alive in this land and go ahead and try to talk to him and they will discover that hey this person actually does have powers they can raise people from the dead and they clearly have some other things going on such as creating all the flesh golems and uh, you know trying to keep the peace and all that so we have all these indicators that could guide your players here so when they arrive they should get the full treatment they should hear the madhouse going on here they should meet with all of these named NPCs, and of course, they should realize that the abbot is not truly as holy as he seems, but there is some grain of, you know, uh, trying to be good. Just remember that the abbot is not going to be the one to strike first. Your players may get the inclination that they need to go ahead and stop this guy, whatever he's doing, in which case, you know, combat ensues and the abbot does what he does but he will not be the first one to strike. There is a lot more fun events that go down with the Abbot in the special events, but that is for a future video. Of course, in regards of the Abbot, that is going to get its own villain's voice, so that's a separate video. And of course, in regards to all these named NPCs that could be allies, they are going to get their own separate videos. So, <laughs> golly, I'm painting myself in a corner here. I'm going to be making a ton of videos about all these named NPCs at some point. But that is for a future time. This place has a lot going on for it, but it can be ran relatively simply. If your players show up here, they talk to the abbot a little bit, they could, you know, find a place to stay for a little bit of time and then go ahead and bounce because they don't want to deal with the abbot, they don't want to deal with the monger folk. But the question is, what happens if they do deal with the abbot? What happens then? Do the monger folk go crazy and get let loose? Who knows? Do your players commit a full blown genocide and wipe out the monger folk? In which case, what is the abbot going to do in retribution? Perhaps the abbot is actually okay with the monger folk dying because their sad existence probably shouldn't have been tolerated, but he didn't have it in himself to go ahead and end them. What about the named NPCs located around here? What are you going to do with Vasilka? Vasilka being this poor amalgamation, this flesh golem. What's going to happen to her? What's going to happen to all the named monger folk that are around here? Are they going to go ahead and strike out against the party? Or maybe not. If the party does enough damage and they're clearly powerful enough, maybe the named monger folk around here that are smart enough aren't going to want to deal with it and decide to run away. 
And do you have Esmeralda B here? Esmeralda can be encountered in various different locations all around in this module, but if you don't have any inclination to go ahead and have her pop up anywhere, this is a perfect time to do so. In which case, Esmeralda can go ahead and start saying such things as, oh hey, you know, I'm against Strahd, let's work together. Hey, I think something's a little fishy with this Abbot, let's go ahead and investigate around. Let's go ahead and talk to them and see what's going on. Of course, there's a lot more fun things to be had with this Abbey, and I'll be covering that in all the named NPCs and also the special events of the Village of Kresk. That is going to do it for me. Thank you so much for watching, and thank you to all my amazing patrons up here. You guys are absolutely awesome. Thank you so very much. That is going to do it for me. Thank you so much for listening, and I cannot wait to see you all in the next one.